Hi, I'm Larry Rudolph. Uh, I'm at Two Sigma. Uh, I have affiliations with other places. I've been an academic most of my life. I started my career in high performance computing because I want to understand how groups of people work together. So it's easy to understand how groups of machines work together. Uh, the, uh, I have to put this up because I'm at a financial institution. I'm not giving you any financial advice. I'm not allowed to, and if I did, don't take it. Because <laughs> definitely I'm not the right person for that. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but um, I will start with one issue I want people to sort of come away with. When people try to explain the cloud, I can't remember who did it, but he said, um, uh, it's like it's like pets and cattle. I don't know if everyone knows that analogy, but the idea is that we were treating computers like pets. Everyone had their own computer, it had a name, we knew how big it was, if it crashed or if it died, we were really in trouble and very sad. That doesn't scale, right? So we had to go to livestock or cattle, and the cloud can be looked that way, right? If there's 5% of the machines die, it doesn't really matter, they don't have names, I don't know about them, and, and that's how you have to deal with things at scale. We're similar to data to compute, is now we're dealing with data. And at Two Sigma, we have data at scale, and we have data at real big scale. Um, and so what is the deal with pets versus cattle? Because certainly all our researchers and our modelers you know, treat their data sets like pets, and that doesn't scale. So if you don't want to listen to my talk, think about what maybe the right analogy is with <coughs> data and scale of pets. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how much time I have, so I just decided to start with this summary and do it backwards. So, um, for, and for those, you know, my dogs don't have much attention, so maybe you are either. Um, so we start with that there's this cloud, um, and it just says, you know, uh, my job is there's a bunch, just a bunch of jobs, and I just need to sort of map them onto some machines somehow. And you know, that's the world. There's just some things. data and there's jobs, and that's it. Um, of course, if you look at it from the tenant's point of view, it's just the opposite. Is that, you know, oh, the cloud is just a bunch of computers and some storage disks, and that's all there is around there. Now, here, if you work in the cloud, no, 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 that's not the case. We have different kind of machines, we have networks, we have reliability, we have blah, 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 right? And if you're in from data side, they say, no, we're not just, you know, we have different data sets, their relations, da da da. So it really is obviously somewhere in the middle, and there's this connection, right, between the, the workflow, not the individual jobs, it's not the job, and the clouds. So, you know, this phrase in my, my saying is that, you know, no application is an island. Right? It's not just, it used to be that way. Well, I grew up, that was a job. You had a job and that was it. You didn't care about anything else. Jobs now are not an island, right? They are, they are services, they're connected, there's pipelines, they get run every day, they're sort of just part of the assembly line. In the same way, no data is an island. You can't just look at the data set, it's just sitting there, right? No, you know, some of it's index, some of it's not. Uh, it, it, uh, it gets transformed, it gets every day more and more come, it's extended and the like. So, you know, there's sharing, there's lots of data that's shared. If you do machine learning, you know, every you start to learn AI, ML, you can say, oh, there's all the MNIST data set or ResNet or whatever, but everyone's using them. It's, it's not just your job and your data set. There are, People are sharing data sets left and right and repeating with, with, you know, within a single researcher, within an organization, between organizations, data is being shared all over the place with the code. So there really is this way of trying to figure out how to map. And this thing, this interconnected pipelines of shared data, jobs, inter this whole sort of mess there with the same mess of the cloud. But it can't be that. Each one looks at the other one, it's like, oh, you're just a bunch of jobs, or you're just a bunch of machines, right? We have to sort of make that connection really strongly. 
And I mean, cause, you know, no servers in Highland either. I guess it's that part, right? Um, and the Mass Open Cloud has certainly taken this step along the way with a lot of the projects we've heard about, right? If you give me the dad of your Spark job, right? We've learned that you can do much better caching. You can do improve jobs even more. If you say, okay, here's HPC and here's HTC, and we put you know balance those together, we can do much, much better. So really the Master Cloud has sort of began to take these steps. So I'm saying you have to think about it in a much deeper, longer term, interactive way. And that's sort of the main message I want to give. Um, so at scale, right, lots of things happen at scale. And we talked a little bit about that, but you have to think about it even more and more and more. Right? There are emerging properties that happen at scale. Right? There's 10 minutes left, and I have to try to sort of put the speed thing in 10 minutes. Uh, at scale, um, these emerging properties are fun when you look at schools of fish or starlings in the sky. But you know, emerging properties means that you sort of lose control of your data. Bad things happen that you don't know about. Someone changes a schema somewhere, and no one knows about that. And down down the pipe, some job crashes, and no one knows why. Yes, you know, the kernel and the hardware have to get intervened. That's, that's the low level, and that's really true, but it happens at every scale. And so I'm saying, let's repeat what we've learned from hardware and, and software and scale it up. So this picture I took, but it was at the um, zoo in, in Jerusalem, and these are black swans, and it's like so ironic that in, that in, in Israel they only have black swans, at least in the zoo. So, like, you know, so it's just all these anomalies going on all the time. And uh, that's what we have to worry about. We face that with data daily. And it's not just two sigma. It's anybody who starts dealing with data that somehow, at some point, they lose control of their data. They don't know who's using it, who's writing it, which jobs are looking at it, and it turns out to be the scale problem we had with the servers we had with data. With data. How do we make progress with that? With metadata, data about data, but not the data itself. With lineage, the dependencies, we use the word provenance, I mean it's metadata plus lineage, each of our on its own. It's really hard to get lineage, but a lineage is really important. And it's becoming more and more important. I'm not the first to notice this. There's lots of companies, startups, big companies trying to deal with the lineage problem, um, trying to collect it. Uh, well, whatever. I go on and on and on about lineage. Um, where do you get lineage? Well, if you have all your data in a database or a big query, or then it's like you have to sort of worry about the queries. And that will tell you who's reading and writing the data. If you don't have that, if you just use data frames and pandas or just CSV files or the like, you can go and annotate your code, or you can go and look at all the HTTP requests and some low level, some high level. All of this is really hard, and for two segments, it's especially hard. You don't want to always go into every piece of code and rewrite it. And looking at things at the lowest level, there's just too much going on. So we pick this intermediate level, which is looking at the logs, scraping the logs, and you get lineage from that. Um, that was the wrong picture. I was just had my, my wife, my daughter, and my grandson together, but oh well. Um, uh, anyway, um, in, in really, Having metadata, having lineage, having provenance, it gives you a lot of benefits. A lot of side benefits that the community, the big world community, talks a lot about. It talks a lot about observability. I can debug things when I know the whole chain of dependencies. I can put governance in to know, you know, has this data been co-reviewed before it's put into production? Is it always allowed to see which data and the like? There's uh, uh, data discovery, which is a big problem. We have so much data that we don't know sort of what's where and, and the like. So metadata, lineage, provenance, those are all have a lot, a lot of benefits. They're hard to get, 
and they're hard to keep accurate, but once you get them, they have a lot of benefits in many different dimensions. For the MOC and for the collaboration of what's going on here, I say, well, it's really about just this connection between the two. It's between the data center and the data. Uh, I heard a talk by Chris Simovich on, on Risk Five yesterday, and it's all about uh, the main specifics. So let me just give you this little review in my summary slide, and go back. So in the old days, we had a job and we had hardware. It was a general purpose machine with a general purpose language, and we just ran, put the two together. They said, you know, I can do a lot more better optimizations on the job. And we did a lot of optimizations on the job, and we did a lot of optimizations on the hardware. And there was some connection between the two. Branch prediction, caching, all that stuff. Had some close interplay with the compiler and the optimizer. But then what happened is that what we have now, the current generation, is you know Apple's building their own processors, Tesla's building their own processors, they're just, and they're not being sold as processor chips. They're part of this vertical. I know my workload, I know the right hardware for that, and I put those together. And that's just the natural evolution. That's just what's coming along the way with the right standards. Where are we with cloud and workloads? Are we at the batch early stages? Are we at the position stages? Or are we at the main specific stage? And I think we're not quite down there yet, but I think we're moving there. And we need to sort of go there, which means get, get the metadata, understand the uniqueness of data centers. We already seen that, I said, Azure, now people are talking about they have better low latency, and suddenly HPC wants to live there. ChatGPT wants to live there because they need that low latency. So clouds may start becoming sort of specialized in part of this vertical, and I think we're taking the first step. Does do the hyperscalers, a company who sells, rents out machines, they don't really care that you're optimized, that your code runs faster, in fact, the less optimized you are, the more money they make. Right? The mass open cloud, on the other hand, right, is all about right getting the most work done, bang for the buck, right? Is that close collaboration? So really, right, we're aligned. The goals of the tenants and the goals of the MSC are really aligned, and um, I'm saying we should sort of move in that direction. So I started with the slide, I ended with the slide, and I thank you.